Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Tristan Claridge and I'm the convener of the Social Capital Research Group. Um, we're a, a loose collective of, of researchers and, and academics and people interested in social capital from all over the world. I think we have um, about 1,200 or so members. Um, and we hold webinars and, and events like this on a regular basis. And so today we have an invited presentation by Professor Troy Glover. Uh, Troy is the Professor and Chair of the Department of Recreation and Leisure Studies and Director of the Healthy Communities Research Network at the University of Waterloo. Professor Glover's research explores the process of transformative placemaking that shapes environments and facilitates social connectedness to improve the quality of community life. So over to you, Troy. All right, thanks, Tristan. And um, <clears throat> again, I'd like to thank you personally for inviting me today. And I'm very excited about today's presentation. All right, today, um, <clears throat> the title of my presentation is Exploring the Endogenous and Exogenous Pathways of Social Capital. And again, thanks for the kind introduction, Tristan. Um, I, I want to begin just by uh, acknowledging my field, which is, um, of course, recreation and leisure studies. Um, I don't know if folks out there think that's kind of a strange area in which to study social capital, but I think it's largely premised around the um, idea that Portes um, wrote about a long time ago, I guess 1998, where he talked about how if social capital is about anything, it is about, quote, the positive consequences of sociability. So any context that encourages or facilitates sociability ought to be considered relevant to the development of social capital. Uh, with respect to my own research, leisure has been a context in which I have explored social capital and its development. And so I'm not gonna speak so specifically about leisure experiences. I'd instead like to use this opportunity to talk about, um, I guess, the conceptual rigor that we bring to understanding social capital. And for that reason, I hope it's of interest to many of you. I will uh, say that I was really impressed uh, being a big fan of Robert Putnam's that um, I attended the seminar I guess a few months ago, and that was fantastic. And I feel very flattered to be part of the seminar series uh, in which he also presented. And here is just a picture of me a few years ago. I tried to track him down when I was on campus at uh, Harvard just to introduce myself because he's been very influential in my career in terms of kickstarting my interest in social capital and clearly through his work on bowling alone and um, um, other, other um, papers that he drafted uh, in the 1990s. I'm gonna begin with my definition of social capital. I don't, I don't mean to be so bold to offer this. I know that there are some pretty uh, standard and, and um, canonical um, definitions that exist within our literature, but I, perhaps it will give you some insight into how I understand social capital. Um, along with my colleagues, Kim Chenu and Diana Perry, we define social capital as the consequence of investment in and cultivation of social relationships, allowing an individual access to resources that would otherwise be unavailable to him or her. Now, I um, want to, again, give that definition to give you some context in terms of where I'm coming from. First of all, I think it's important to underscore that over time, as much as I've been influenced by Robert Putnam, I've become increasingly in influenced by those scholars who focus on access to resources and the role that social capital plays in that process. I also want to uh, underscore the, po the point about, whoops, about <laughs> individuals, I don't know what happened there, um, about um, individuals, I guess that Mark's gonna stay on my screen. Um, the role of individuals in the process of social capital. And so I, I'd like to emphasize that in today's presentation, I'm very much going to focus on the, it's, uh, the, the process of social capital at the micro level. And I, I've written elsewhere that while social capital is embedded in people's social rela relationships, it is nevertheless realized and utilized um, by individuals for a variety of ends, some of which are not communal, but rather personal. So I guess this idea that um, 
from my perspective, social capital is actually accessed by individuals. That's led me to be very interested in that micro level. Um, I'm also somebody who does qualitative research. And so the work that you're going to hear today is really premised upon conversations with different groups of different individuals and their experiences in this process. Um, I also wanted to mention that you know, the micro approach um, is important to me because as I advanced my career, and I've been in um, an academic position now for about 20 years, 21 years actually, um, it's important to me, uh, at least in terms of the evolution of my research, that I went from understanding you know, social capital and perhaps its application within a leisure context to appreciating that it has a role in excludability in offering differential returns in terms of its access by individuals. And so uh, a lot of my research really tries to recognize what Foley, Edwards, and Deany called use value. That is appreciating that uh, the extent to which social capital is actually appropriable by individuals. So with that uh, out there, I just wanted to give that sort of context of where I'm coming from in today's presentation. I'm presenting to you now a logo from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign where I began my career. And it uh, stems from an experience I had there at the very beginning of my career. I was invited to give a, a seminar on social capital and kind of introduce it to a group on campus. Now, uh, to be fair, there were a lot of individuals on that campus who were studying social capital, but I gave this presentation. And at the end of the presentation, somebody asked me, what is the role of leisure in this process and how important is it? And to tell you the truth, at the time, I was really baffled by this question, which has become as a surprise, but I didn't really see it as any different from any other context. It just happened to be a context in which social capital develops, it's accessed, uh, it's distributed, that sort of thing. So that was generally my question or my response to the uh, question that I received. But after that seminar, I really started to ask myself how much I understood in terms of how the process of social capital worked. And so I've spent quite a bit of my career trying to answer that question. How does this process work? That led to a collaboration with, um, with uh, my colleague, Diana Perry, who's also in my department at, um, at uh, the University of Waterloo in Recreation Leisure Studies. We authored a paper jointly that was based on her dissertation research. Diana had studied women who were experiencing infertility and their experiences, and I guess the role that leisure played in terms of helping them cope with their experiences. As she described her research, I found that as I was asking her questions about it, and she was clarifying what she found in her study, that the process that she described really, to me, spoke to social capital and how it works. So I'm going to describe that to you today, and, um, and then I'm going to sort of build off of that where I've come from since. So to begin, basically, uh, what we found was with this group of women who are experiencing infertility, that having a shared interest or a, a shared experience um, in terms of infertility brought these women together. They didn't know each other beforehand, and it led them to actually, um, it, it sort of invited them to have um, a common interest, a common uh, uh, issue that they were dealing with, and that kind of brought them together in friendship. I think this is important, uh, and this largely um, connects with the idea of the homophilus principle, which is the notion that you know, birds of a feather stick together. Um, it's, it's hard, as much as we talk about bridging social capital, there must be some connection for people to open themselves up to relationship building. What we found that was that 
while individuals can come together based on that shared interest or shared adversity, it was really within a sphere of sociability that they built, maintained, and sustained their relationships. So as you can imagine, this group of individuals, uh, they may have understood that they were all dealing with the same uh, health issue. And, you know, it uh, led them to get together um, and, and they would get together within a context where they could be sociable. They'd go out for coffee, they'd go out for a drink, they'd go out for a walk. And during that time, they might uh, express their, you know, or describe their experiences um, with infertility. They may, but it may lead to other things. Uh, in other words, it was really the sociability um, component of that interaction that led them to, I guess, nurture their relationships so that they strengthened those. So those social ties would strengthen. And that was important, not just in terms of building those relationships, but also maintaining them. Um, and, and I guess that was the point that circled there is, uh, you know, uh, it's it as a circular process, if you will, relationship building, maintenance, and uh, sustainability is really important in terms of being able to uh, access social capital from a social network or from social relationships. Now, in building this relationship or maintaining it or sustaining it, it led to a byproduct. Now, I do want to acknowledge this difference. Uh, Diana and I, when we discussed putting together this model, um, I was very much of the mind that social capital is very much a product of a relationship as opposed to a byproduct. Um, and it kind of comes back to what I call the chicken soup hypothesis. You know, if I'm sick and uh, my uh, peers, uh, you know, I expect that my peers are going to show that they have, that they're willing to give me some social support by bringing me chicken noodle soup. And if they don't bring that chicken noodle soup, it kind of gives me a reflection on that relationship. Is it truly, is there really something there that bonds us in terms of me being able to uh, appropriate um, for, for my own benefit? And, uh, and Diana, of course, when she was studying women, particularly those who are infertile, she felt very uncomfortable referring to social capital as a product of the relationship. And so that's why we've used the language of byproducts. And I would be open to people's perspective on that. But the byproduct that I'm talking about here is social capital. And in particular, what we found was as these women who came together because they had the shared experience of infertility built and maintained and sustained their relationships, they built up uh, a sort of uh, amassed rather uh, um, a stockpile of social capital upon which they could draw. Now, social capital in this case took the form of things like norms of reciprocity, obligation, and group sanctions, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, drawing on this social capital, what we found was that the women were able to then um, again appropriate it to, um, I guess, advance their health and well-being, either in a positive or potentially a negative way. In a positive way, it could lead to expressive action or the idea of getting by. In other words, if um, a woman called up, you know, her friend with whom she built a relationship and asked, you know, wanted to vent, wanted to uh, receive social support, you know, that she was able to draw on that stockpile of social capital to access that support. In addition, um, she would be able to um, engage in instrumental action, or at least the social capital would facilitate instrumental action. In other words, it would enable them to get, by, get ahead, rather. So things like if they had questions about their infertility treatment or somebody in their network had discovered information that they were unfamiliar with, um, such as like a doctor or a specialist that may be able to help them, 
they were able to get that sort of information that would help them get ahead. We also found that social capital could um, facilitate something that we called obstructive action. And here, we're talking about, I guess, the darker side of social capital. And this was illustrated best by these women who, again, had come together because of their, uh, their shared experience of infertility. Well, there were examples where some of the women would over time actually get pregnant. And in some situations, they would invite their friends that they um, made to um, something like a, um, a shower, a baby shower. And that led a lot of the, um, you know, that, that sort of introduced a situation where from a health and well-being perspective, it wasn't especially uh, productive or positive for those women who were still experiencing the infertility. And yet they felt a sense of obligation to the individual who was pregnant. And in some cases, they feared group sanctions. So in other words, the peer pressure from other people in their network, um, they worried that by not attending the shower that they may actually be in a position where uh, they may be ousted from the group because of uh, their lack of support for that individual. So these are the types of actions that we sort of identified in terms of this process of social capital, if you will. And what we found was, depending on their experience um, in, this exp in this process, that the individual would either exit that relationship Again, if we have an example where the individual is, you know, choosing not to attend a, is perhaps even offended by being invited to a baby shower, they may exit that relationship. Um, on the other hand, um, because of social support, because of the information that they gained, they may perceive that relationship as something that they're loyal to and therefore, you know, continue to invest in that relationship. So based on this model, um, basically it, it's framed in a way that I think is consistent with what Portis described as something that conceptually we need to think about when it comes to social capital. We need to separate sources. So in other words, social networks, social relationships, social ties, social connections from forms of social capital, things like reciprocity, trust, obligation, group sanctions, and from the outcomes associated with social capital. And so I think this particular model does that well. You know, I'm quite open to your feedback and look forward to a discussion about it. Ultimately, what it's led to is that model that I presented is very much an endogenous uh, model of social capital or an endogenous pathway. And of course, if you're not familiar with the two terms, endogenous social capital really originates within social relationships or networks, whereas exogenous social capital derives from sources outside of immediate social relationships or networks. And so if I were to redo this model, um, here's what it would look like uh, in terms of the endogenous pathway to social capital. It's the idea of coming together because of shared interests, shared identity, which represents an opportunity to invest in a relationship. It leads to building, maintaining, and sustaining social ties, which represents the actual social investment. It then moves toward generating social capital, things like obligations and expectations, information potential, norms and effective sanctions. And this represents the return potential of those relationships. And of course, those could be leveraged to facilitate action. Things like getting by, getting ahead, acting together, so collective action, which I didn't include in the previous model, and falling behind. Uh, you know, again, the obstructive action that I mentioned in the previous example. And that represents the return on a social investment. And of course, the individual can choose based on his or her experience to exit or continue to be loyal to that partnership. All right, so that's, that's in a nutshell, 
the endogenous pathway to social capital. And from my perspective, you know, again, coming from the uh, from leisure studies, my interest is very much in that sphere of sociability. I see leisure playing an important role in terms of bringing people together so that they can build those relationships that lead to the development of social capital. Now, I do wanna say that I've been very influenced by Bourdieu's work. Uh, and of course, I'm sure that many of you are familiar with his definition of social capital. I wanna underscore one point that he's made in his definition. Um, he defines social capital as the aggregate of the actual or potential resources, which are linked to possession of a durable network of more or less institutionalized relationships of mutual acquaintance and recognition. Now, I present this quote because durability is something that he's identified in his definition. And that is very consistent with the model that I presented. In short, you need to have some sort of a durable relationship for that to for that process to actually result in um, you know, the development of that stockpile of social capital. Interestingly, I was on sabbatical at the University of Otago in 2015, or 2014 rather. And at the time, I was very much, you know advancing the model that I presented to all of you. And then I attended a presentation by Rob McNaughton, who is a faculty member at uh, the Auckland Institute for Technology, I believe. Rob really um, shook my perspective on the model that I presented. He uh, presented, made, made, offered this really interesting presentation on something that he called temporary social capital. And he defined temporary social capital as a form of social capital characterized by ties that are quickly formed, often in response to a challenging problem or exogenous shock, and that have relatively short lifespans, dissolving once the problem is resolved or situation stabilized. Now, this coincided during my sabbatical in New Zealand, and um, I had this experience while I was there where my family and I were visiting Akaroa to uh, go on a cruise to view dolphins and perhaps even swim with the dolphins. On my way to Akaroa, um, I had hired a car and on the way there, my daughter who's pictured here was feeling rather sick in the back seat of the car. And at one point, I think we were about 10 minutes away from Akaroa, she said, you know, daddy, can you pull over? I'm feeling sick. And I said, we're almost there, just keep it together, don't worry. Two minutes later, she said, look, dad, I really need you to pull over. I said, no, no, don't worry. We're almost there. She threw up all over the back seat. And then, so, you know, uh, we, we cleaned up the, the car, cleaned her up, brought her to the hotel. And, uh, you know, over time, she felt much better. The next day, we went on this cruise um, in Akaroa. We boarded a boat, set off and you know toward the ocean as we left the bay uh, which was as flat as glass we ended up experiencing some pretty rough waves on the ocean and the boat was going up and down i was with my daughter who's pictured here in the back the stern of the boat and uh, i was because she had thrown up the previous day i was very concerned that she was going to be sick again so at some point i just sort of urged her to go back into the cabin of the boat. As we moved into the cabin of the boat, I started to feel exceptionally ill and found myself for the next three hours just unloading off the side of the boat feeling ill. Now, I mentioned this not to gross anybody out, but to say what was interesting about this experience was that another tourist who was on this cruise, uh, without me even knowing, um, looked after my daughter for the entire cruise, made sure that she was safe, she was okay. Uh, my wife and my, um, my other daughter were elsewhere on the, on the boat. And um, you know, so this tourist who I didn't know stepped up and really helped out during that entire experience. So 
This coinciding with the presentation by Rob McNaughton caused me to revisit the endogenous model that I presented and make me question about the durability, how important a durable network is to social capital. And so that led to my interest in the kindness of strangers in tourism. Along with my colleague from Otago, Sebastian Phillip, we uh, wrote uh, that arguably acts of kindness involving visitors and community hosts represent the quintessential measure of a civil society, what Putnam ultimately aimed to advance through his body of work. So what I found in terms of my career, career trajectory is that at the very beginning of my career, I was very influenced by Robert Putnam's work. And I found myself moving much more, uh, I guess, away from it as I entered into a focus on the endogenous model and more focused on access to resources. Interestingly, with this focus on kindness of strangers, I started to rethink the endogenous pathway. And that led me to start uh, thinking about the following questions. What explains pro-social behavior and generalized exchange? What motivates complete strangers to assist one another? These questions seemingly trouble the endogenous pathway described uh, earlier by implying a direct investment in a relationship is unnecessary. If you recall, the model that I presented for the endogenous pathway assumes that a relationship is built. In other words, to extend the metaphor of social capital, you know, by investing in the relationship, I will potentially see a return on that investment at some point in the future. The question is, is that direct investment unnecessary? Or is it? So that led to me uh, trying to conceptually work out how an exogenous pathway to social capital would work. Now, again, I want to remind folks that I'm very focused on the micro level, which may have influence, which definitely influenced my perspective on how this pathway works. Now, just to make sure I get across this content effectively, I'm, I am going to read from a text, but I'll try to do so in a way that is um, compelling. So uh, bear with me here. So whereas the endogenous pathway to social capital suggests familiar and well-acquainted networks of close social ties uh, constitute this source of social capital, the exogenous pathway identifies imagined communities as the foundation for support and assistance. Imagine communities, I'm sure most of you are familiar with, are the um, refer to socially constructed communities invented by those who perceive themselves as members of a group. The idea comes from Benedict Anderson, who used community to explain the deep affinity people feel toward nation states. Anderson argued nationalism relies on the capacity of a large population of people who could never in any practical sense meet each other face to face, nevertheless uh, imagine themselves as members of the same community. That people identify with and are even willing to die on behalf of other citizens draws upon the idea as opposed to an actualization of a common community. This idea can extend beyond the national level to include communities at the international, regional, local, and or even micro level groups. In all of these cases, repeated discursive practices enact and reinforce particular understandings of community. Along these lines, Hertzfeld suggested Anderson's idea of an imagined community grounds itself in the social poetics of everyday life. This cultural intimacy, as he described it, transforms the abstract idea of community into intimate expressions of felt solidarities. Accordingly, the imagined community inheres in everyday interactions and experiences with other perceived members to reinforce a collective identity derived from an awareness of a, a common affiliation. So again, we're focused on this first part of the model. Moreover, dissemination of group symbols highlight community boundaries and enhance perceived collective unity. 
These reinforcing experiences serve to build relationships, solidarity, and identity. And so members cooperate with strangers who they believe belong to their imagined community, especially after they themselves have received assistance from such strangers and feel a sense of gratitude. All told then, an imagined community repre represents the imagined potential of social connectedness. Collective identity connected to an imagined community provides a simple intrinsic motivation for generosity in generalized exchange. Having imagined themselves as members of a community, individuals seemingly come to trust other members, even those they do not personally, though uh, the develop through the development of injunctive norms. Injunctive norms refer to normative obligations to express one's gratitude at being helped, not by repaying the helper, but by acting as the helper acted. Trust in this sense represents the return potential of an imagined community with the expectation that fellow community members will come to each other's aid if needed. This trust in an imagined community implies its members share values that serve its membership. In many ways, this type of trust resembles what Uslinner uh, described as moralistic trust, the idea that trust is a moral commandment to treat people as if they were trustworthy. This commandment assumes a belief in the goodwill of the other or a greater faith in humanity. However, skepticism abounds with respect to the development of generalized trust, the idea that most people can be trusted that broadens to include indiscriminately, uh, it, it, sorry, broadens to include everyone indiscriminately. Uslaner conceded, trust is unlikely to extend from our in-group to strangers because there is little reason to believe that these experiences will be similar. Evidence suggests that particular, sorry, particularized trust, only trusting your in-group may be more realistic Instead, belonging to an imagined community, a kind of in-group with its own boundaries of membership, engenders expectations that fellow community members can be trusted to reciprocate pro-social behaviors. Eventually, community members encounter strangers, including individuals they perceive as members of their imagined community through either direct or indirect contact facilitated by an unexpected or novel situation in which they find themselves. This contact presents community members with real, a real life scenario, a dilemma, a problem, a shock, in which they are faced with the decision of acting on the trust they believed, perhaps unconsciously, was present within their imagined community. The presence of such problems or shocks has been found in situations that lead to temporary social capital. For example, such situations arise when tourists are unfamiliar uh, in unfamiliar environments and or in which tourists needed to resolve a particular practical problem related to traveling, such as accommodation arrangements. In these situations, the problem or shock led to an interaction between tourists and strangers. Faced with such a scenario, all parties, both benefactor and recipient, must make a swift risk assessment and conduct a cost-benefit analysis. Here, the decision to trust someone, either to provide them with assistance or to receive assistance without being exploited, becomes strategic and perhaps not moral. As Uslaner pointed out, strategic trust is not predicated upon a negative view of the world, but rather upon uncertainty. In such circumstances, people must test their belief about another person's trustworthiness with respect to the situation that has unfolded. Thus, interdependencies arise that require immediate decisions and rely on abrupt trust judgments to provide guidance. What uh, Jar Jarvin Pa and Liedner, referred to as swift trust, develops quickly to allow people to manage issues of vulnerability, uncertainty, and expectations in the absence 
of a developed relationship. Swift trust can be thought of as a specific type of trust that forms rapidly without firsthand knowledge of a person's track record or the time to wait to develop one. Actors in such scenarios often rely on social heuristics to determine when and to whom to give the benefit of the doubt when uncertainty regarding their trustworthiness is present. Accordingly, swift trust assessments often depend on stereotypes, which can lead to biased perceptions and potentially inaccurate trust decisions. Um, Schillick and uh, Huang found that trust accuracy can be expected to be relatively low when no interpersonal contact pre precedes the exchange. However, they also demonstrated that even short periods of superficial interaction may be sufficient to substantially increase the accuracy of SWIFT trust decisions. Their findings suggest that relying on SWIFT trust just judgments can be reasonable as long as at least a minimal opportunity for socialization is provided. It is important to note, note here that generalized exchange, while pro-social, does not constitute altruism. To qualify as exchange, generalized exchange involves an expectation of repayment in terms of future benefits or a, rec a recollection of past benefits or both. Grateful people are not merely kind to others, in other words, they pay it forward to connect with others and consequently acquire a central position in a social network by cultivating many social ties that increase their adaptiveness in the long term through the process of indirect reciprocity. In comparison to other forms of social exchange, then, generalized exchange introduces a greater risk of not getting paid back. And in, and an advantage for the recipient of, um, and an advantage of the recipient of not having to be paid back either. Should this risk be overcome, however, the social benefits of generalized exchange, including enhancing the ability for groups to achieve their goals and potentially motivating other forms of collective cooperation through greater solidarity and social capital. Receipt of assistance then facilitates action by allowing the individual to get by, to receive social support, get ahead, in other words, acquire resources to improve the situation, or fall behind, feel taken advantage of. Assuming a positive outcome, both benefactor and recipient benefit from the exchange. While the recipient receives much needed assistance to work through the problem he or she faced, the benefactor, in addition to potentially receiving expressions of gratitude from the recipient, may expect the, to experience an enhanced reputation, increased happiness, and greater feelings of self-worth self as a result of uh, his or her pro-social actions. Thus, Widom suggested individual and collective benefits of generalized exchange make it especially valuable form of pro-social behavior. Depending on whether the generalized exchange resulted in a positive or negative, the experience either reinforces the existence of the imagined community or leads to mistrust and questioning of it. Interestingly, Malm et al. in 2007 posited that general exchange promotes greater solidarity than direct exchanges by generating greater commitment, trust, and affective reward, and by producing feelings, stronger feelings of social unity and group identity. So all told, the exogenous pathway to social capital is very much premised upon the notion that a belief in an affiliation leads to the development of social capital that can be drawn upon in scenarios in which strangers need support to facilitate pro-social actions. Accordingly, it fits very well with Putnam's civic approach to social capital research. <laughs>
Now these, of course, when I'm talking about these, I mean, the pathways that I presented, the endogenous and exogenous pathways really represent ideal types. So they do require further investigation, examination um, from a conceptual perspective and from an empirical perspective. But they do introduce some interesting questions from my perspective, including what is the interplay between the two pathways? How are these pathways utilized for darker purposes? And what are the implications of the limin liminality of experiences for social capital? In other words, how important is durability of relationships? Now, I know we have a lot more time left, but I do want to open it up to questions at this point. I've essentially presented these two models. I know that people study social capital from very different perspectives. And so I'd be very intrigued to learn uh, from you and get your feedback on your perspective associated with the information I presented today. So um, thank you for listening. I'd like to open it up to questions at this point. Thanks very much, Troy. Fascinating presentation and, and really great. I can see in the chat there's quite a lot of um, comments and questions, so I'm sure there'll be no shortage of them. Um, Marin, if you want to um, bring us back to the, the first question, but while you're doing that, I thought I might ask the first one, Troy. Sure. Um, I was interested in, um, it seems that a lot of authors really suggest that social capital, uh, all of the outcomes of social capital are action. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a bit of a suggestion that maybe some outcomes aren't action. I mean, what are your thoughts about that? Mm, that's that's really intriguing. I, I To tell you the truth, I haven't contemplated that before. As you can see from the models I presented, I'm, I guess, in that camp of, of um, seeing it as leading to action. I'm thinking about um, the flip side of that. What, you know, in terms of... Um, could it lead to inaction, I, I suppose? And I guess from that perspective, it's very conceivable to me that as individuals interact, that there, you know, when we talk about social capital representing forms such as sanctions, such as, um, such as um, uh, obligation, such as norms of reciprocity, it's quite conceivable that individuals by not taking action are actually failing to take action intentionally because of those forms of ca uh, social capital. In other words, for instance, I could em envision a situation where, um, you know, again, related to, I guess, if we think about peer pressure as an example of group sanctions, if my peer group does not want to visit a certain area of town, which is a terrible example, but um, you know, I may be compelled not to do so. I may be compelled to inaction, not because I don't want to go to that area of town, but because my peer group could uh, sanction me or because I feel obligated to my peer group for whatever reason not to go there. So I guess that would be my initial response. I'd not thought about that before, um, Tristan. I think that's really quite fascinating. And I certainly would open it up to other people's perspectives on that, if anybody's got one. Well, I think that idea about inaction is a fascinating one, and it could relate to, um, you know, somebody who's mm -hmm. in need of help, but norms um, actually creating a situation where people don't help because of the norm. Yeah, uh, you know, don't yeah, take absolutely. action. Yeah, um, that's, I, that's a excellent point. And I think also like where social capital has moved, particularly into the mental health literature, the, yes. there's, a, there's some questions there about the, the benefits of sociability that don't necessarily relate to action. You know, the, the way in which a sense of belonging can actually, you know, which is considered a part of social capital can also be an outcome as well. Um, you know, the benefits for mental health. And so, you know, I think this is an, a very interesting area because so many of us sort of consider the outcomes of social capital to be action, but yes. then the non-action outcomes sort of, you know, the, clearly there are some, but how do we actually take those into account is a really interesting topic. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for raising that. Well, should we move on to the next question? Marion, who was, who was first? You're muted, of course. Here we go. 
Is it okay that I'm sharing my screen? I just thought I might have to go back to some slides if people have questions about them, but I'm yeah, also- Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's fine. fine. Yeah. yeah, okay. Uh, Tristan, I, I haven't kept checked through yet the uh, people, whether or not people are here to ask their questions that they actually submitted earlier. Um, been following the questions. So I'll do that while David's question comes up first here about how important do you think it is for actors have a structured approach or explicit strategy. David, do you want to talk to that at all? You're talking about agency here. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Marion. And thank you, Troy, for your uh, presentation this morning. <clears throat> it was uh, really thoughtful and, um, and very much in sort of uh, two parts. So this question was very much on the, on the first part uh, when you were talking about um, indi uh, Indigenous um, social capital. And I was thinking about, um, uh, you know, the process map that you had there about uh, how people will uh, engage and then get value out of at a social capital. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was curious to get your thoughts about um, how structured do you think people should be in their approach to extracting value out of that social relationship? Mm. Well, in many ways, what you raise is, is the point that I mentioned earlier and that point of contention that I had with my colleague, Diana Perry, around referring to social capital as either a product or a byproduct of that relationship that's formed. Um, I think she certainly would make the argument that it's disturbing to her <laughs> to think that you know, these relationships might be premised upon the notion of, to be blunt, exploiting resources, you know, exploiting others to acquire resources. And yet, um, I do think that it's probably fair to say that in some instances, we do enter into relationships intentionally to acquire or access some resources tied to that uh, social tie. So, um, you know, I kind of go back and forth between those things. I, I don't know if, if, if you feel like I'm answering your question directly. Um, when, when you raised it, it just struck me that it, it very much um, connects back to, to that question I had around byproduct versus product. Um, so, so I could sort of envision that, that there are people who intentionally enter into relationships so that they can exploit that relation to, to acquire resources and others who don't do so explicitly, but perhaps that, ac that access to resources is, um, communicates how to that individual, how important or that relationship is to the other if that makes sense. D does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does. And that's sort of what's coming out of my research is that um, I, I was expecting that there's uh, a, um, that the motivators to actually contributing or be being involved in a, in a network uh, were predominantly um, um, to actually participate in, in the network. And what I was finding from my research, which is on project managers, yeah. that they were there to extract value from that network, but it, that shouldn't be taken in a negative sense. It means that right. they, yeah, uh, I agree. they then valued the relationship and they were more likely to put uh, effort into building uh, the relationship in those networks. Yes, I can, I can see that completely. Um, it, it almost, uh, to me, uh, you know, along that endogenous pathway or perhaps even an exogenous one, but I think we're talking about the endogenous one, you know, leading to that notion of instrumental action, being able to get ahead and entering into a social network with the explicit intent that the network itself will help somehow advance that individual. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And that's probably also, it, it's, it's about how people interpret the nature of the relationship as well, that people can be yeah. act, acting instrumentally where basically you're, you're acting you know, collectively for a common purpose. But if someone is seen mm -hmm. to be free riding or exploitive, then it, it, yes. it changes the nature of how people feel about it quite considerably. Absolutely, yeah. So in the literature, there's a few different definitions uh, of resources in the context of social capital. Mm -hmm. um, do you tend to follow Nan Lin's um, approach with this or do you have a different approach? 
Um, I am very influenced by Anne Lynn's work. And so I think, and you can see that in terms of the language that I use with respect to expressive action in instrumental action. Um, I would credit him with sort of um, alerting me to those terms for sure. So how, how would you define resources then in that context? Um, yeah, good question. I guess I'm talking about any um, anything that's Boy, that's a, that's a good question. Because <laughs> I think, like, just to, to help yeah. you through it, I think um, Nan Lin sort of talks a lot about resources, social resources being things like, you know, wealth and, and power and, right, and social right. influence and so forth. Yes. But I think w why I'm bringing this up is I think some of the social capital literature perhaps is focused more on resources being almost, you know, material resources, financial resources, you know, these kinds of things that yes. might be mobilised in a network. Um, and there's quite a big difference, of course, between, you know, wealth and power and, Absolutely. you know, money and, and equipment, you know. Yeah, no, and I think that's a great point. And I would say that, you know, in terms of my own research, I've probably been more focused on the latter as opposed to the former. But it is interesting to think about both of those things being something that can be um, appropriated to advance somebody's uh, well-being. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, um, Jacob, you had a couple of different questions that you want to pose some of yours next. OK. Um, first, it's a bit off topic, but you mentioned the returns of um, social capital. Um, I think you um, take um, your point of view is its uh, returns for the individual. And um, I, I'm not sure I'm generally interested um, about the returns because I'm an economist. And as Adam mm. Smith said, um, um, economists know the price of everything but the value of nothing. And um, um, basically, I was always interested um, if someone made, as, made the try to estimate the returns of social capital mm. in a quantitative way. Because um, it would be first interesting for people to say, where should you invest your time? And mm -hmm. if someone looks at the macro level, it would be even more interesting because then you could make a case for, for, um, for political um, actors. Why should you invest in um, creating social capital? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you know anyone who made such a trial? Um, no, I'm. I'm afraid I don't, and that's probably just a reflection on the type of work that I've been doing. Um, I would put it out there, and, and I, this is probably a very controversial topic uh, in this forum and in terms of different approaches people bring to um, studying social capital. But I wonder sometimes if, if there's an assumption that social capital exists, where sometimes it does not. And what I mean by that is um, if we go back to the you know, chicken soup hypothesis that I mentioned, you would think that if I interacted with an individual, built up a relationship with them, you know, over time, that they would be a source of social capital to me, a source that I can um, access social capital. But you know, clearly there are situations where, you know, uh, I think Tristan had mentioned the idea of like where people free ride, perhaps they exploit relationships. And it becomes clear that this wasn't actually a genuine friendship, wasn't a genuine relationship. And I think that that to me um, makes it very challenging to determine to what extent does a, a stockpile of social capital exist until somebody attempts to access it. So I'd be interested in people's perspective on that because I think that uh, would be somewhat controversial in terms of how some people understand and study social capital. Uh, I don't know if you have some a response to that, but I would, I would welcome any perspectives on it. it it's definitely an interesting thought. Um... I have another question, which is, which is totally sure. different. Um, yeah. You um, spoke about the, let me find the term, 
the um, concept of ima um, imagining, um, yes. imagining um, community. And David Easton, uh, I admire him greatly for his work on David, um, system stability. He had this concept of different system or communities uh, to identify with. Do you see any linkage between your work and his work? Because I somehow, sometimes he was, what I've read from him, which is not very much, he was not very clear about this, how this communities um, got into existence and what they actually were. On the other hand, um, for um, the political science, how to mm -hmm. create loyalties with different um, levels um, is clearly a relevant question. It's even mm -hmm. more relevant with the um, search of the right-wing populist, which mm -hmm. um, change from um, system loyalty to loyalty of to a, I don't know, somehow un, unknown group. And um, so I found your, your thought on this quite intriguing. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate you mentioning that in large part because I'm unfamiliar with the work that you cited. Um, so I will definitely check that out. Unfortunately, because I'm unfamiliar with that, I can't really respond to your question. All right, no problem. Should we move on to the next one? Who, who was next, Marion? Sean had uh, a comment, but not a question. I'm wondering if you wanted to put forward a question. Sean, then. Kia ora, Troy. Um, I'm in um, Dunedin, um, New Zealand. Um, and I studied uh, recreation therapy and I uh, oh. came across your work um, a few years ago. I spent time in um, North Carolina doing an internship uh, 10 years ago. Um, I just um, I went for a walk one day and came across a quote from John Muir. When we pick out anything by itself, we find it connected to everything else in the universe. Um, my question is, on the eve of the, um, the Glasgow COP26 conference, what role can these practitioners in theory have in um, helping us understand ecology um, and and uh, reduce emissions? Like mm. yeah, what? Get my drift. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that's a really interesting and timely question. Um, I'm just thinking if I could, I don't know if I can, how I go back with my slides. But uh, anyway, um, you know, I, I guess um, I guess it comes down to appreciating that uh, that our social networks have uh, enormous influence on ourselves and on individuals. And so um, I guess when I think about advancing you know, pro-environmental attitudes, whatnot, um, that, or, or if, if we even talk about collective action, which, which I, I think you know, I identified at the end of both models as potentially in, um, a way that social capital can facilitate action that if we work backwards from collective action, that really, um, um, and, and I would imagine that like when we're talking about the environment, that both models are very applicable in terms of the need to think of ourselves, one, as part of an imagined, a larger imagined community, maybe a global community and acting in that regard, um, or perhaps even, um, you know, being part of a network that values those types of attitudes and expects that membership within that network um, is going to require that people have that sort of pro-environmental attitude. So I guess if you're asking how can social capital be leveraged to advance pro-environmental attitudes, I think that comes down to the networks to which we belong and, and whether they do value that type of behavior and expect that of their membership and enforce it through sanctions or uh, through uh, a sense of obligation by members, which I guess um, that latter part really refers to that that's me thinking from the standpoint of that endogenous pathway. What about but certainly, I could. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. 
Okay, what about the role of um of leisure? Uh, how can we improve our understanding of leisure beyond you know um a sense of free time to actually get more a sense of civic participation um, and return to classical meaning of leisure? Yeah, well, I think that's a that's a great point. I mean, um, certainly there's there's um, you know if if we think about well being from the standpoint of moving away from and a hedonistic model that is really focused on meeting our own desires um, versus say a more eudaim eudaimonic model, which would be more advancing our own um, uh, advancing ourselves and and um, and and like. Um, I'm struggling with how to define eudaimonia. Um, um, you know, more along the lines of what you were saying, uh, moving away from instrumental uh, gains and focus more on, um, you know, things that we might value that don't necessarily have um, that that sort of uh, commercial value to them. I think that leisure very much, if we could shift our attention away from that, he did not. Um, hedonic model that I think that it would very much maybe give us a wider perspective on how to value those things around us and, and seek to improve ourselves uh, through the things that we do in a leisure context. Does that help? Yeah, yeah thank you. That's good. I think, I think on Sean's first question about how social capital perhaps relates to climate change and climate change action, mm -hmm. like all of the themes associated with these models are, are very, very relevant to the potential mm -hmm. kind of action that we would like to see, you know, the way mm -hmm. in which, you know, values and beliefs are shaped through social interaction within social relationships. You know, that's really the, the engine house of creating and, and recreating our our, our reality and our belief system, but also the role of the imagined community, um, potentially, like Absolutely. you mentioned, you know, at the, at the global scale to also potentially shape the nature of our values and beliefs to also then potentially result in some sort of action. So I think, you know, all, are, all of uh, social capital mm -hmm. is so incredibly related to these kinds of issues, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at the same time, I, I tend to find that as a concept, social capital doesn't provide us with a huge amount of explanatory potential for how we can go about mm. changing things at those really macro levels. You know, you know, if we yes. set ourselves that task, you know, okay, we want climate change action on a global level, how can we use the concept of social capital to help us? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if there's a lot of answers really coming out of it, even though, you know, these questions are fundamental to what social capital is really about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent point. So I think, Marion, I think your question might actually be next, if you if you have one you want to ask. Yeah, before we go there, Tristan, um, I'd just like to mention to Troy that we do get questions from people beforehand that we send to you, mm. but we'd like to encourage people to come and actually join and, and have a conversation. But there's some fantastic questions from Brazil and mm. Spain and various places. Mm -hmm. uh, but Tristan, I, I think we've got sufficient number of questions to keep working through for those that are here. Would that be? Would you be comfortable with that, Troy? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Let, let's keep with the ones who are here for now, and then we can dig into the other ones if we need to. Okay. Um, well, I'll skip David's chicken and egg, which comes first. Mm. <laughs> the network Thank or the you. relationship. <laughs> Good question though, which comes first? Yeah. Yes. Uh, and I can't actually quite remember, but I'll actually, oh yeah. Look, uh, in the tourism industry, um, <laughs> which I worked in for many years, um, mm -hmm. there's this stranger on the train phenomenon where yes. people um, will declare much more to a complete stranger that they think they're never going to see again. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is that explained by uh, some of what we've seen here today? Like that's swift. Swift social capital, isn't it? But it's it's a really strange so. phenomenon. Yeah, yeah, and I think that really is what led me to explore that exogenous pathway because I had for so long sort of appreciated that the way that social capital works was consistent with the way I perceived an endogenous pathway to work. And so um, in that exogenous model, I am trying to introduce I guess you could say pain points where it 
isn't necessarily going to result in a positive outcome. Um, and I think what made me think about that is if we go back to the example of me in Akaroa throwing up over the side of the boat, um, you know, would I have been helped if I were a different, if I belonged to a different race, to a different ethnicity, if, you know, different gender, um, if, if um, my sexual orientation was different. Um, and so within that exogenous model, I am trying to, you know, try to introduce that possibility that, that there are situations where individuals are unwilling to view that, you know, I guess a, a potential benefactor is unwilling to view a potential recipient and vice versa as part of their imagined community. Mm. And that can you know, lead to inaction um, sort of along the lines of what Tristan was mentioning before uh, in, a, in a negative way. So um, I, I don't know if that responds to your, your no, no, it's a, question. No, no, it's but... an interesting thing. And, and people spend so much time. Uh, the yes, question yes. of why people travel uh, yes. post-pandemic is becoming an important question. And being able yes, to unburden yes. from my observations of people, the stranger on the train, and, and what are people actually gaining through the experiences as, as they actually travelled into these, do these become yeah. their imagined communities or not? So, yeah, yeah, and... And I, I guess I grappled with to what extent, and of course it's it's always more complicated. But um, to what extent do people have to have some sort of interaction with one another? Do we automatically help somebody who we, you know, ascribe to our particular tribe, um, or you know, do we need to have some level of interaction? Because you know, Canadians for the longest time, and I suspect still do, travel with. Canadian flags on their backpacks, you know, to indicate that they're Canadian, they're not American. No, no offense to my American colleagues and friends, but um, um, that's important to them. You know, if I automatically see a Canadian flag, am I more likely to help that person just simply by seeing that symbol? Or is it conceivable that, you know, through interactions with them, even if they are Canadian, I may think they're a jerk and not want to help them at all. <laughs> <laughs> or for offensive reasons, because of my own prejudices. I don't help the person yeah. because they're not the type of can Canadian I am. Yeah. So anyway, it's, it's I know Fascinating that Fascinating area. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank you. This is um, certainly very, very complex because it's, it's yeah. really, it's not just about whether or not you, um, you perceive as someone as being similar, but it's also about recognition. So if yes. you if you recognize an accent that is similar to your own, yes, you know there's so many things that can trigger that kind of response, mm -hmm. um, which is is not necessarily based on the existence of a social relationship. True, uh, but but I guess I wonder to what it, it gets back to what I was saying earlier. To what extent ex extent does there need to be some level of interaction? Uh, hearing that and then. I don't know, viewing them, um, their behavior. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there are psychologists who have done this type of research and I need to familiarize myself with that literature, but it just strikes me that um, when, it, when I pose the question about how important is the durability of a relationship, um, we can have these fleeting experiences, but do we still need to have that interaction is is some interaction necessary that you know during which we make some sort of judgment and i don't tristan, know i mean yeah tristan yeah. wouldn't be happy if i didn't ask a question about habitus and dispositional and enactment of some kind <laughs> yeah okay so yeah. let's move along okay <laughs> You got away with not um, not asking a question by the way mary right. but should we, should we move on anyway did i Oh, you posed it, but didn't give Troy an opportunity to respond to anything. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, it's a long question. I'll leave that to the end until everybody okay. else. We'll, see if, we'll see if we have time. So there, okay. there, was, there was a question from Kay about how the pandemic might have changed things. Yes, um, that's right. Specifically that's in relation to your, your, to your diagrams. Um, mostly because the interactions have changed online rather than being face-to-face. -face. So do you think that does mm -hmm. change anything in your models? I don't know, because um, 
and I, I, I'd be interested in people's perspective on that. Um, I think one of the things that I was thinking at the time in terms of developing the exogenous model, and this actually stems from Rob McNaughton's talk that I attended that I cited in the presentation. He cited the example of entrepreneurs uh, because he was very much interested in international business and entrepreneurship. And he mentioned how a lot of international entrepreneurs will assist people from other international jurisdictions uh, in accessing their particular domestic marketplace, but without having built up any sort of relationship. And often these happen online. And it led to sort of a discussion in his presentation about those individuals who, and it happens a lot, who respond to um, an online dialogue or you know, if, if, uh, a discussion board where somebody asks a question about how to fix this or how do I do that, what motivates an individual to respond in that situation? I mean, we don't know the other person who's posted the question, what's in it for the person to actually respond and offer that, that answer. Um, and so the exogenous model, I, I was trying to think about that context as well in terms of how it might unfold, but probably didn't do such a great job of, of specifically speaking to that type of scenario. I guess that's a long way of saying, um, I think there are aspects of the model that still are applicable. It just comes back to, again, that question about swift trust. And do we make, how, how are judgments in those circumstances made? When we talk about virtual relationships, is there something that gets in the way um, during that relationship development that may be very different from in-person? I mean, we, we do know, as a matter of fact, that you know, um, in-person contact has a very different, um, different implications for our health and well-being. If, if we're looking at it from that standpoint. But I, you know, again, this is a long way of saying I'm, I'm not, I think there are probably features of the exogenous pathway model that, that actually can still be preserved in this context of COVID-19 and virtual relationships and stuff. But, but to be sure there are components of it that probably need to be revisited. It certainly seems like a huge amount of it is is just still fits within the model. You know, the yes. interaction is is creating relational properties. Um, the only difference is that the the relationship might be quite separate. Um, and yes. I guess one of the key differences on with digital and online communication is there's the, the social sanctions tend to be quite different, um, and that can really sh um, make some significant differences in the way that social norms then are generated and and perpetuated. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, boy, can they be mobilized online. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So there's a comment from Stephen about when we're Stephen, talking yeah. about action and non-action. And he, I think he makes a mm. really good point that yeah, yeah. The, the potentiality for action, the fact that we know social capital exists and there's the potential for action might actually be you know, most of the benefits that we're talking about that are non-action. Um, you know, same Stephen in the context like of ask. mental health. Perhaps mm -hmm. Stephen would like to ask the question or elaborate. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate the fascinating discussion and uh, platform today. Um, and yeah, the question really comes out of the uh, the conversation about inaction and non-action and sort of mm -hmm. recognizing uh, social capital as that relational asset. Um, and that mm -hmm. I think, as Tristan pointed out, you know, maybe doesn't necessarily uh, need action. Um, mm -hmm. but that uh, that person may have a sense of feeling relationally rich or connected, knowing there is potential uh, for yes. action if it's needed, something to, to draw upon. So that was just mostly a, a comment, um, just listening to the conversation and following it. Um, I might pivot to uh, an, mm -hmm. another question that I found fascinating here uh, today, and that is um, you know, related to the durability of networks mm -hmm. and the stability of systems. And I'm just curious if you have maybe further comments on that.
recognizing that it seems like the world at large uh, mm -hmm. is is becoming more unstable and less durable. Um, and I guess where I see that mostly is in the context of working with communities uh, within institutions and organizations where their leadership changes all the time mm -hmm. and relationships mm -hmm. that have been built over time, social capital that's been built over time, uh, goes away every time mm -hmm. another organizational mm -hmm. change happens or a community change happens. So I think it's more just kind of a, a general question about uh, network durability, uh, yeah. system stability, and if that's something that uh, we maybe should dig into more and pay more attention to as we talk about social capital. Yeah, well, I will. Uh, I'll, I'll just respond immediately by saying yes, we should pay more attention to it. I think it's a really fascinating question, uh, and I think for me, what really has resonated with me when I've had this discussion with students and colleagues is I think about Facebook. <laughs> And I think about, um, I guess I think about, you know, those individuals with whom I had a relationship you know, when I was in kindergarten or, uh, you know, in preschool uh, with whom I've maybe stayed in touch or, or perhaps even who, I, you know, those individuals who I've had friendships with in the past, but for whatever reason have not stayed in touch. And the question for me comes back to <clears throat> how important was the reinvestment in that relationship? And I think that what we understand in social capital is that it's important that that investment, you know, that we reinvest in the relationship for us to maintain some semblance of a stockpile of social capital. And that kind of makes conceptual sense to me. But at the same time, and perhaps these are just anomalies, you know, I ask myself if somebody with whom I was very close friends back, you know, years ago, let's say 40 years ago, I'm 49, um, that person, you know, an individual gets in touch with me and asks for a favor. How do I respond? And I think that from what we understand in social capital theory, you know, because we, uh, because we haven't for the past 40 years interacted, you know, invested in that relationship, built, maintained, sustained that relationship, that I'm less likely and perhaps not likely at all to grant that favor. But it is conceivable that there are individuals who were so special to us in the past that, you know, that we may be willing to um, uh, grant them that favor. And so it just, for me, I know this isn't exactly the, the example that you were, you were raising yourself, but for me, it's that type of example that raises for me the issue about how important is durability to these relationships? I mean, clearly when we talk about fleeting experiences with others, there's very little, if any, durability to that relationship. We may never see each other again. And in fact, you know, the example that I used about Akaroa, I have no idea who that woman was who stepped up and looked after my daughter. And frankly, I, I haven't seen her since. We didn't stay in touch. I'd simply thanked her. And that was the extent of the relationship. And yet, you know, uh, in many ways, she was willing to, um, you know, I, I kind of drew on the kindness of a stranger to, uh, to access social capital, if you will. I don't know if, <laughs> if I'm making sense or if I'm, if I'm uh, uh, answering your questions direct, question directly, but um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think, Stephen, also, I think that your question really relates to the, what, the reason why social capital as a concept is so incredibly popular. You know, mm -hmm. it, I think it speaks to the need to start to, to value these things that I think have been undervalued, particularly in the last sort of 50 or 70 years. And so um, I'm not sure that, you know, social capital says that these things are important, but we still need mm -hmm. people to actually take that seriously. You know, you know, I work with a lot of businesses and they quite often will have literally done the calculations that if this particular employee leaves because they're unhappy, they're not being paid enough, whatever the reason might be, it's going to cost, mm -hmm. you know, $10,000 to train somebody else to take their place. But those businesses don't take into account the social capital that's lost. You know, the, mm -hmm. the relationships, mm -hmm. the networks, the trust, the reciprocity, all of those norms and everything else that's associated with that person's position within the organization. 
And so social capital hopefully can start to communicate those important, uh, you know, social and relational assets in a way that maybe businesses can understand. Um, so I think really, you know, what you're saying is, is vitally important and it speaks to how important the concept of social capital is and the reason why so many people are interested in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. All right, Marion, who is next? Well, we have a, a question come in from one of our Russian participants, which uh, I've asked him if he wanted to ask, but he did not. So, Tristan, if you could uh, ask that. Yeah, um, so the question was, could we consider human capital as a sort of source of the exogenous social capital? Uh, so early dropouts equals mistrust. Do you mind repeating that? Sorry, I just I didn't quite pick up the entire thing. Um, could we consider human capital as a source of the exogenous social capital? So where early mm. dropouts equals mistrust. I guess it's, um, I guess that comes back to how you understand social capital. Um, and I guess um, when I, or human capital rather, I guess my understanding of social capital, it, or sorry, human capital is that it is resides in individuals. It's sort of a, um, uh, it's, it's, it belongs to the individual, him or herself. Um, so I'm just trying to conceive of how that might work, um, you know, as, as a, in terms of the exogenous model and how it might um, um, play out in that pathway. Uh, maybe, maybe, um, if others want to offer their perspective on that, I'd, I'd welcome their their views. Um, just in the in, I'm from the human resources background yeah. and yeah. Um, organizational behavior, and some of us interact with uh, psychologists quite a lot. Um, mm. In the organizational context, uh, the parameters that drive trust are completely different to those that drive mistrust. So having it as a, um, you know, either or construct can be actually sort of difficult. So you, know, mm. you have to have caution with saying that because something doesn't drive trust, that it drives mistrust because the drivers of it can be very different. If that's right, right. the conversation. Yeah. That's okay. well known in the, in the human resource or behavioral organizational mm. psycho psychological area. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. So caution. Yes. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> yeah, anybody else? We're welcome to have some input on that one. Um, otherwise, we can move on to the next question. So who is next, Marion? Um, yeah, uh, you know, just trying to flip through. Um, and we actually had a new participant that uh, Kingy didn't want to ask a question. Is that correct? No? Okay. Um, and so Sahil is next. Is Sahil still with us? Sahil yes, still with us? Yes. Did you want to ask a question about um, sure, transaction? Sure. Yeah. Mm, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, it was sort of hinging on the discussion about whether there is a transaction that creates capital or not. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just wanted to know your thoughts on uh, how transactions and, you know, the acknowledgement of a transaction might be capital building. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, th I think, uh, I guess, how I might apply a transaction, certainly to the exogenous model, it, it, to me, it, it kind of is important in terms of advancing pro-social behavior by, um, you know, if, if individuals engage in some sort of um, experience where they've had a problem, and somebody's come forward and assisted them, then uh, they're more likely to pay it forward in the future, which is, you know, again, consistent with social capital. Um, so I think that transaction becomes really important for um, social capital in, in the future. Uh, at least in the context of pro-social behavior. Um, you know, I guess um, in, in both models, transactions 
depending on how we want to um, define them, it seems to me that, that it's very much part of the experience that individuals have with each other and relates back to their interactions that may have consequences for whether they exit that relationship or that network, or they remain loyal to it or continue to like um, view themselves as belonging to that imagined community. So I think, uh, I guess it depends on what we mean by transactions because certainly interactions are vital to both processes. Um, uh, you know, if it's an exchange of resources, I'm not sure if, if that's what we're referring to in terms of tr a transaction. Um, I'm not sure that it's necessary. Um, but again, these are these are great questions that um, I'm, I'm self-conscious being the only one responding to them. And I would I would invite anybody to offer their own perspective on it. I think it probably also relates to what we were talking about earlier about the attitude people have towards um, particular events or particular types of interactions. So, you know, a transaction, as you're saying, is clearly an important part of social capital. It's part of that interaction. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. if a transaction is perceived as being transactional, mm -hmm. as in sort mm -hmm. of free of the relational components and potentially exploitive or just simply for the sake of profit mm -hmm. and benefit, mm -hmm. Then I think that situation either does very little to enhance social capital or potentially actually damages it um, if it's seen mm -hmm. as being transactional. So um, it sort of gets into that nuance of how people interpret different events, and each individual person can interpret things differently as well. Yeah, absolutely. Certainly a compl complex area for sure. Just checking on how much more time we've got, Ab. Ricardo uh, Stanton Salazar was here and asked several questions, but has sadly had to leave. Uh, but Mazut uh, has a uh, is still with us here now and has a question. Uh, how are we going for time? Um, Troy, how much time do you yeah, have? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to uh, stay put and answer any questions. Sh should we okay. should we put a cap on it though? Should we say just another ten minutes or so? Yeah, that sounds yeah. great. Yeah. Okay, so um, Masut, did you want to ask your question or would you like me to ask it on your behalf? Yes, please. Thank you so much for this opportunity and thank you for all social capital research members um, for these kind of valuable programs. And my question is, um, let me read the question. I would like to know that did you have any findings on the cost and benefit analysis as an economy for the trust and to calculate or the, yes, to calculate the trust and mistrust? Is it possible to calculate their numeric values as a quantitative values of this kind of value? In this may maybe it may it may be easy if we calculate it. It may be easy to compare them in the coming future. It means I would, um, for example, in big data, big data, you know, natural language toolkit or natural language processing. Uh, is very um, popular in these days is a Python programming language, etc. So, uh, secondly, um, for example, why I try to uh, ask um, this question in as an association, it means as a social capital, the many associations are coming together in, in the past, for example, Lloyd's List in 1691, it was uh, formed in UK. The uh, one person um, formed a coffee, and the people came to this coffee and started to talk about business. And later, insurance um, companies come that coffee, and later they published newspaper. So they uh, gather the people, they release their information about shipping, ship uh, trader, etc. And today. And later in 1741, 79 insurance company, insurance uh, or not insurance, underwriter people who make insurance, they come together and create Lloyd's, new Lloyd's list. And today, you know, Lloyd's list is a reinsurance company in the world. It's very huge company. So in our research, we saw that they come together and they create their own social capital. They move to today and they use their historical 
relations, etc. What you mentioned in your presentation. So, if we gather all of them, is it possible to uh, calculate as a quantitative uh, quantitative numeric? Is it possible to calculate trust, mistrust, and that kind of relations as a part of social capital? Well, sadly, I'm a qualitative researcher. So um, I'm probably the worst person to ask that question to. But um, I think that you've made a compelling case of why we might want to do so. I'd have to leave it to my colleagues who are more, you know, better positioned to respond to that to answer your question. But I, I thank you for it. Yeah. Um, and similarly, yeah. And I'm also qualitative as well, so I also can't comment. Thank you. Thanks, Mazut. Uh, and I think Simon is um, has been with us, uh, hanging in with us, and deserves a question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you talked a lot about sort of uh, micro, well, the micro in general. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if, if there's a pathway where we can take what we understand about the micro and use it to understand the macro. So, for example, if you look at the pandemic as a as the macroist of macro global <laughs> exogenous shocks to <laughs> communities at all <laughs> levels, <clears throat> can we reduce it down to a set of micro shocks, whether they're dependent or independent? Mm. Is that a path to understanding or reacting to the pandemic or does it become intractable instantly? You know, you've raised an important question that, that I, I raised toward the end about how do these two models interact? Like what's the interplay? And I think that's a big question that I have um, you know, in, in, in many ways, a next step and you raising you know, issues that arose with, with the pandemic, uh, that may be a, a, a good context in which to think through that interplay. I don't have a good answer for you, so I'm sorry, but I think you've raised an excellent question and certainly a question for uh, further research. I think it is an interesting Thanks. one as well, because I think sometimes we assume that um, you know, within a relationship that only the, rela the properties of that relationship dominate the nature of action within that relationship. Um, but of course, the, the wider social setting, institutional setting, cultural setting, historical setting, all of those things still, of course, play some level of influence in the, mm -hmm. in the nature of every, every relationship. And it, it may be true, just in very general terms, that very, very strong relationships are, are dominated by relational properties, whereas weak relationships are dominated by the wider social setting, perhaps. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. But you know, I think we sometimes just make an assumption that, well, there's an established relationship and therefore it's relational properties that dominate. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas I think that sort of uh, generalizes the, the complexity of, of the way in which we, you know, relate to different people and, and act within different relationships. Yeah, no, that's insightful. Uh, Simon, did you have anything to follow up? Well, I, just following up maybe on what Kristen, or what, sorry, what Tristan was just saying was that not all relationships, even relationships of equal strength, mm -hmm. are treated are created equal. Yes. Um, and we've seen during the pandemic that um, different relationships have held together, but some have completely dissociated um, mm -hmm. for reasons that might not have been predicted mm -hmm. early on, whether it's um, access to um, internet and digital devices, or whether it's you know personal feelings on on, on science um, mm -hmm. and vaccinations. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. been an interesting sort of sandbox to to look at social capital and relationships and community. I agree. I agree, and um, I think I think you know, your original question really speaks to the complexity of of these interactions. And and um, you know, as I mentioned, the the pathways that I present are of really ideal types, but so much more to flesh out, like in terms of how they might you know the interplay there and. Um, the complexity of relationships and, and, and social capital itself. Well, I think I, I have a background in, in physical sciences and physics, and there's a mm. long history of starting with simplified models and then trying to extend them. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I have confidence that it can be done, yeah. but it might be intractable, as I was saying. Yeah, yeah.
think this is central, really central to what social capital is all about. You know, Jim Coleman talked about the mm. the micro macro transition and the potential for social capital to perhaps provide macro level explanation, basically using micro level phenomena. And so, mm -hmm. you know, this mm -hmm. is really central to what social capital is all about. I think. Yeah, I agree. Can I sneak a question in about methodology, Troy, before yes, you go? Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Heartened to know that you're uh, the article I read of yours um, earlier was uh, narrative inquiry and mm. uh, storytelling, which is the model I'm, folding, uh, I'm following. Is there any, uh, what are your thoughts on any adjustments to that methodology over time? Uh, you know, like given today's questions, there's lots of, we, you know, we sit in the world of, you know, quant versus qual, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, anything you've seen of value coming out of um, any other added to that added methodology to the storytelling and narrative inquiry, just out of interest? Um, yeah, good question. Um, I mean, I, I think um, as, you know, as we all do, I think my thinking on narrative inquiry is, is kind of, um, um, evolved over time. Um, but with that said, I, I, I guess it comes down to, um, from, from my perspective, um, I find it a very effective way of trying to get at how relationships develop over time and how, um, how resources have been accessed through relationships um because typically at least from my perspective there's usually a story to that acquisition if you will of resources yeah and um and so because of that i think i think uh what's appealed to me about narrative inquiry is unlike conventional qualitative research where we deconstruct stories take them apart find common themes i think the uh, retaining that narrative structure is very is is very helpful in terms of helping us understand the meaning behind those relationships and 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 uh, and and even the role that social capital plays in that sort of uh, relationship. So I'm not sure I'm answering your question, Marion. Uh, no, in I just I'm wondering about. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm wondering I'm about the imperatives of artificial intelligence when. They keep on seeming to be uh, analyzing everything we're saying through AI. So I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> the question for future. Yeah, absolutely. Someday somebody yeah. might pop up and say, do you know your dispositions are X from your social media profile? Yeah, absolutely. Who knows? I could, yeah, I'm sure that's happening now. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. It's a worry. Yeah. Over yeah. to you, Tristan. Thank you for that, Troy. Thank um, you. Marin, do you know if we've missed anybody, missed any questions? Um, I'll be uh, uh, Ricardo, who had to leave, um, sadly. But uh, I think apart from that, uh, Ricardo had to go. Um, did Alfredo have a Al question? Alfredo had a question, but has had to leave, sadly. So. Oh, I think Alfredo's showing in my oh, list no? is still here. Alfredo, did you yeah. want to ask your question? Oh, sorry. I can ask it on your behalf if you like. Um, so the question was, yeah. how to increase trust and solidarity at the national level? Um, I think it is a question of giving uh, security in general and better conditions for people. So the question is really about increasing trust and solidarity at the national level, how you go about doing that. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> tough question for me to answer. Um, I think because I'm so focused on the micro level, it's it's a bit challenging for me to answer that um, question in any meaningful way. Um, but I, you know, I, I do think that there's a tremendous amount to be gained thinking about imagined communities and the role that they play um, and how they can be uh, leveraged to advance certain actions. So I'm sorry, I don't have a great answer for that. And I think like most people tend to think that the, the macro level um, social capital, uh, you know, takes a long time to change. It's kind of, you know, rooted in history and tradition and culture. And so can be uh, fairly slow to change over time. 
Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas the, the micro level within individual relationships or individual groups can be really dynamic and change incredibly quickly. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, there's certainly some hints there at the national level about how we might do it, you know, along the lines of, of security and, and, you know, better conditions for people and people having that sort of sense of, of identity with the, and, and belonging and all of those things. But it, how you actually go about doing that seems like a much more difficult task and something that perhaps takes yeah. quite a bit of time as well. Yeah, I would agree. Good question uh, for the tourism people. Though. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So, so let's wrap it up there. So I'll, I'll stop the recording in just a minute, but we'll, we'll stay online for anyone who would like to ask any informal questions who don't want it as, as part of the recording. Um, before we, we end, though, I'd, I'd like to really thank Troy for, for his time. Um, it's, it, it takes a lot of time to put these sort of things together in preparation and, of course, your time here today. So it's really greatly appreciated by, by everyone who took part in the entire group. So thank you very much, Troy. Yeah, and thank you, Tristan, again for inviting me. Um, this has been great. I think um, one of the challenges of being in any field, I think, is that there are always a small group of people who study social capital. And so it's nice to have such a large community in which to present ideas. And I would uh, invite anybody, if they have any uh, questions or comments in particular, I'm, I'm very interested in the various comments that people have about the uh, pathways that I presented. Uh, I would welcome your comments and, and really um, enjoy a dialogue, a, a further dialogue. So don't hesitate to reach out. Absolutely. And this, you know, we're talking about social capital. That's exactly what we should do, you know, collaborate, yeah, so communicate. I'll, I'll put up my information. Together. Just, uh, yeah. <laughs> anybody wants to get in touch with me.